join us today. Um, we are going to get be getting started in just one minute, um, but I just want to take a moment and officially welcome you. So good afternoon and welcome to the first official event of the Women's Alliance Network at Rowan University for the 2021-2022 calendar year. We're so excited you could join us today. And really, we're just so honored today to have our guest speaker with us, Mrs. Jean Edelman. Um, and you'll be hearing more about her in a moment. And also our moderator for today's event, Dr. Julie Haynes. Um, so our board is committed to providing uh, time and space for professional development for women and all of their richness and diversity. So we're so pleased that you could take some time away uh, to join us for today's special event. You're gonna be hearing some just really lovely words of wisdom and advice and really lessons about how we as professionals can help to not only take care of ourselves, to center ourselves, but make sure that our cup is full. So we're able to live our best lives and be the best professional that we can be. So we're so excited to share this wonderful programming with you today. Um, on the ha behalf of the entire board, I'd like to uh, welcome Mrs. Jean Edelman. Um, I'm sure this is gonna be a very inspiring conversation. So I'd encourage you to get a pencil or a pen and a pad of paper ready, cause you're gonna wanna really write down some very wonderful little nuggets of joy and nuggets of truth for today's event. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce today's event moderator, uh, Dr. Julie Haynes. Uh, Dr. Haynes is a professor of communications here at Rowan University and the director for the Center of Advancement of Women in Communications. Julie, thank you so much for agreeing to be our moderator today. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. How to do it. Thanks so much, Chrissy. Uh, together with the Rowan University Women's Alliance, I am thrilled to welcome today's honored guest. She is co-founder of Edelman Financial Engines, a dedicated Glassboro State College alumna and a best-selling author. During her time as a student, she was the first woman to be elected president of the Student Government Association and received the Distinguished Senior Award, the university's highest student honor. She was named later named Alumnus of the Year, is now a member of the Board of Trustees, and recently served as co-chair for the university's first ever comprehensive campaign. She and her husband are benefactors of the Edelman Center for Nursing at the Innova Health Foundation, the Edelman Indoor Writing Arena for the Northern Virginia Therapeutic Writing Program and Rowan University's Edelman Planetarium and Edelman Fossil Park. <laughs> As one of the most successful women in the Washington DC business community, she has been long focused on sharing her personal and professional insights to help women and future business leaders succeed. She was also named by South Jersey Biz as one of the region's women to watch. Please join me in welcoming the woman who has brought us all together, Jean Edelman. Well, thank you, Julie. That's a wonderful introduction. And just hearing it, I just think back to the good old Glassboro days, and it's quite remarkable. <clears throat> but thank you. And it is a great honor to share with all of you today. Um, life is a beautiful journey. And today I want to share 10 lessons with you so that you can, as Chrissy said, be the best that you can be and live a joyful, fulfilling life. So Rowan Glassboro State gave me the best education and foundation for what was to come. My experiences outside the classroom, as Dr. Haynes shared, the SGA, the resident advisor, coordinating Project Santa, um, they were priceless. They helped me prioritize, learn how to prioritize, how to set goals, how to communicate clearly with others, how to be organized, and how to work with budgets. But little did we know what was to come and how these priceless experiences would help us succeed. The truth is our 20s there were many twists and turns. We were learning about the real world and we were finding our talents. I kind of look at life as a puzzle and the to have a successful puzzle, we've got to find all the pieces. And so the journey is to find all these wonderful pieces. So for Rick and I, in our early 20s, we were like any young couple, we wanted to buy a home and have a secure financial future. And 
the silver lining is that we were actually taken advantage of by a financial planner. And that was our why. We looked at each other and we said, we need to do this better. We need to help educate people and we need to help them with their financial futures. That was our why. And so my number one of our top 10 is to find your why. Because once you find your why, all the decisions, all the choices, all the plans, they kind of fall into place and you know your path. Opportunities open up. And for us, it was a huge piece of our puzzle because we created this company that's now over 1,500 employees. We manage billions of dollars. And but the foundation of who we are and our why was education and to help others. So also in our early days, number two of our lessons is to define a need versus a want. Now the world is very different now. In Amazon, you could have an item at your door this afternoon, which is really awesome. But if you can't afford that item, <laughs> and you're putting it on a credit card, there's going to be some problems down the, down the road. And so timing is everything in life. And one of our big lessons, because Rick and I, when we came out of school, believe it or not, there were not really a ton of credit cards. Credit cards, putting things on credit, like just wasn't done. We would get some cash we would, on the weekend, and that would be our allowance of what we would spend. And before we made any purchases or decided what to do, we asked ourselves two things. Did we need it or did we want it? Now, did we need it was food, shelter, clothing. Um, those are needs. The rest of it is just a want. I want my Starbucks coffee and I want my sandwich and I want my, well, if you want a really good, secure financial future, You'll ask yourself, do I need this or do I want this before you go to swipe your phone <laughs> with, your, with your Apple Pay? Um, it's being conscious. It's not spending our money mindlessly. You work hard for your money. We worked hard for our money. And to just kind of be mindless about it, of what we're doing with it, it didn't serve us. And so I asked for you to. Think about, do you need it or do you want it? We define this as delayed gratification. This is a concept that's not known to many right now these days because everything's instantaneous. You stream your TV, you, um, you stream movies. We don't have to wait till Memorial. Memorial Day was like the big weekend, you know, where all the movies came out. It's instant, it's an instant world. But there is this concept of delayed gratification that if you really want something that you save for it and you don't just um, put it on a credit card for, for payments later. That's number two. Number three, this is a big one. Don't be afraid to fail. When I would do the new heart orientations for um, our company, I would tell everybody to find new mistakes because failure is our greatest teacher. When we fail, we find opportunities to grow and to improve. And life is about finding these new mistakes and to keep learning. Even after you leave school, you wanna continue learning through your 60s, 70s and 80s. Our mind, we need to stay fresh and open-minded. And so don't be afraid to fail. Not making a decision creates stagnation. I, I have met a lot of adults that cannot make a decision. I said, go one way or the other, but they can't. They're so stuck and I feel bad for them. So don't be afraid. Life is about movement, always moving forward. And failure is a part of that. If I counted the number of times that we failed in our 36 plus years of business, I, 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 we would never have opened our business. We have, would never have started. And so go out with the mindset every day that you're going to make a mistake and it's okay. And you're going to make decisions and maybe they're not 
the greatest decisions, but we learn from them and we move forward. That's what life is, learning from our mistakes. Don't be afraid to fail. Number four is finding our personal truths and finding our voice. It takes time to find our voice. I'm 62 and I'm still finding my voice. But the key is to understand and step back that each and every one of us, we have an individual journey. We have things that we're supposed to learn in our lifetime. And we can agree to disagree. Remembering that we're all one and we're all connected. If COVID taught us nothing, I hope that it taught us how connected we all are. And learning how to communicate in a positive, productive manner helps us live a fulfilling life. Number five is staying positive. Our thoughts and intentions are so powerful. And when we realize that, we will shift our world. We create our world the moment we get our feet out of bed and put them on the floor each day. If we are setting an intention that is going to be a happy, positive day, we may have some struggles ahead, but we're going to overcome. Or we can put our feet on the ground and, oh my God, it's going to be an awful day. But when we fill our lungs with good breath and we put our feet down and we say, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Setting that intention, having positive attitudes, practicing positive self-talk. We sometimes are our worst critic and, but we need to practice good self-talk. We can do this. We're okay. We're safe. We're going to learn this. We're going to ace this test. We're going to get the next raise. We're going to, it's positive self-talk. It's a good practice to step back and observe because I know that we know people that the world of negativity just swirls around them. It's like a little tornado. And if you just learn to step back and not get pulled into it, you'll be able to hold your ground and keep your positivity. It's helpful to breathe at these moments. <laughs> Having a, you know, just grounding yourself and taking a deep breath, very, very positive, getting yourself outdoors. Because we do need to release this if we do take on some of this stress and negative um, whatever's going on, we need to release it out of our bodies. And so we want to move, we want to breathe, we want to get outdoors, we want to practice yoga, tai chi, qigong, because staying fresh, staying positive, and keeping our body moving is going to help us be healthier. Number six is embracing change. Change is life. Um, if we are not changing, we are not living. Life is cumulative and one day builds upon the other. We change with the seasons. We change with age. And it is healthy because we just get wiser. We get smarter. I don't know if I'd want to be back in my 20s and 30s, you know, when we're struggling and it's hard and I don't, I don't know what I don't know. You know, and of course here I am in my 60s. Again, I still don't know, but I know that the changes are coming and they're positive because we're continuing, continuing to learn and to grow. We, we, the seasons, the earth changes, the seasons change. Get, being connected to nature helps us, I think, understand change a little bit more. I have friends that are, um, you know, selling their home and downsizing. I know that's a long way for most of you, but they're, they're not seeing the positivity and the opportunities and the freedom and you know, so at every stage, at every decade, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, there's just great opportunity to change and, grow, <clears throat> change and grow. Number seven is balance and having good tools in our life to help us process. Life is about challenges. We are all, there's a, 
I'm Catholic and we're, we're told as we're growing up, we're only given as much as we can handle. And we're all given what we can handle, whether we believe it or not at the moment, but we can. And the key is to have the tools to help us. So I look at life, a lot of times there are people that are brought into our life that are meant to trigger us. And we all know what that trigger is. They can whip us up, they can get us angry, they can get us stressed out. But what are our tools to help us step back from that? Because we all have wounds, but it's not productive to lash out with anger and frustration. So having perspective is one of our good uh, <clears throat> tools to help us balance. Learning to forgive, learning not to judge, because we really, we can't judge anybody. We are not walking in their shoes. We have no idea about their life and what brought them to this moment when they're sitting and standing or talking to us. To be open. We need all of this so that we, when we are confronted with these difficult situations, we can move through them a little bit easily and they don't stay with us. That's the other thing is helping to process so it doesn't stick. A lot of us have trauma from our lives, but we don't want to stay that moment, that trauma. We want to progress on. And so these tools, these tools are journaling. These tools are talking to a trusted professional. These tools are having a strong family and trusted family that we can work with. The tools are meditation. One tool that I uh, studied this uh, past year was tapping. I don't know if um, that is in the wheelhouse of anybody, but <clears throat> tapping is a sequence where we literally tap points on our face, on our body, to actually tap out the emotion, the frustration. Um, I have a niece studying right now for her, um, she's a, um, studying for a very large exam. And I tell her, you need to tap every day because you're really stressed out. <laughs> you know, go for your long walks. Um, but I encourage you to, to Google tapping if you've really got something that you can't get through and you can't process, like a, a, a conversation keeps whirling around in your mind, you can tap it out. You, you really can, it's very powerful. Um, go discover tapping. Because the goal in life, the goal for our health, the goal for fulfilling life is balance. So think of the balance as a seesaw, okay. Remember, I don't know if seesaw is playgrounds. <laughs> um, when we're out of balance, when we're too focused on the past, our seesaw is out of whack. When we're too focused on the future, because there's so much that we can't change, our seesaw is out of balance. We want it in the middle. We want our emotions to be in the middle. We want our health to be in the middle. We want to kind of, not that we're monotone all day, but we just don't need the highs and the lows and the extremes because then we're not here in this moment. When you're extremely angry or frustrated, it's kind of like the oxygen gets cut off to your brain. You can't even think, sometimes you can't see. And the point is to be here. And so this is, this is a, a big piece is having the balance and having the tools that you need to process every day. overindulgence, overwork, that's being out of balance. So this is a, this is a good practice. Number eight, this is a big one. And Chrissy mentioned it too, is self-care. Self-care is huge. We don't think about self-care. We think it is maybe selfish to be thinking about ourselves, but as the airplane, they say, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. And so we must look at our day when we start our day, what are our moments that we can have good self care? So what does it mean? What does self care mean? It means blocking time in your day to eat 
please eat. I meet so many people that don't eat three meals a day. When you get up, you need to refuel your body. Eat, drink water, plan on getting good sleep. Have a movement class in your life. Yoga, Tai Chi, Qi Kong. It's, on it's online, you know, it's free. Engage, get outside. Self Self-care is being outside in nature, breathing, getting some walks. A little walk after each meal is so helpful, helps you digest, helps you, walking helps you digest life. Um, you wanna block time to sit and restore and process your thoughts. It means re rebooting yourself. It means a hot foot soak, maybe a warm bath or a massage. Being busy, 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 busy is not the goal. The goal is to be, to be the best human being you can be and to be here. We were just chatting before the, the seminar started. The, there was a silver lining to COVID because we got to be together. We got to cook together, to talk, to communicate, to learn about each other. Um, that was the silver lining of COVID. And now that we're going out, back out, I feel like we're, we're not moving at the speed that we were because we were all gonna, we're all like a train wreck if we kept up that speed. But the silver lining is that we learned self-care, that we learned to be, be together. So self-care, huge. Don't, and and self-care could be sitting and having a cup of tea with no electronics, no computer, just a, a couple moments of quiet, just let your body just stop, just stop. And I know, I know in your twenties and college and stuff, it's not about stopping. It's about going. And I know everybody's been, you know, online learning for the past year, but it is, it's about being and stopping and letting the body rest and restore. Lesson nine is our health is cumulative. And again, when we're young, we don't think about this, but when you get older, you, you're like, oh my God, what was I doing? <laughs> what was I eating? What was I drinking? What was I exposing myself to? And so what we eat and drink today affects our health tomorrow. What we expose ourselves to, the stress, it will affect us and age us more quickly if we don't address it. What this means is that we are connecting our mind, our body, and our spirit, our emotions. It's not just this physical thing. A lot of times we're just living in our head and we don't connect to our bodies, but they're all connected. And I read a ton, there's, you know, there's a brain in our gut. You ever have those gut feelings? Well, yeah, the, the, the better we take care of ourselves, the better that gut, that intuition is going to be very present in our life. When we, when we have good intuition, it's very hard to make a wrong move because that gut instinct, that intuition is going to tell you, yes, enter that room or that meeting or whatever it is, or it's going to tell you to stay home. I mean, it's so, it's so amazing. So I just encourage you to try to connect mind, body, and spirit and, and open up that to your tuition and trust it, trust it, trust it. It will never, ever lead you wrong. Be proactive with your health. Be preventative with your health. Be selfish with your health. Um, loud music, large groups, um, toxic people, toxic situations. Let your instinct and your intuition and your gut lead you to get you out of that. Because if you can make small little changes every day in your eating, your health, when you get to be 62, you'll feel really great, you know, and that's the goal. That's the goal. Lesson 10. Find joy, 
life is beautiful and there are miracles every day waiting for us to see them. The miracles are in the birds that we see or the animals that we see. It's the laughter, it's being in the moment, it's watching funny movies and having a great time with your family and friends. It's showing kindness, being grateful, giving back to others and being kind to animals. I have to put that in there. Animals are so, they're our greatest teachers. So always be kind. And so my most valuable lesson that I have learned and that a happy, fulfilling life is more of an inner journey than an outer journey. And so before I end and we have a wonderful discussion with questions, I do have one little more bit of wisdom that I, I like to share because it gives perspective. It's a Japanese philosophy called Wabi Sabi. Not wasabi that we eat with our sushi, <laughs> but wabi-sabi. And it means nothing is perfect, nothing is complete, and nothing is permanent. Doesn't that give great perspective? We don't have to be so hard on ourselves. We're an unfinished painting that may never be finished, but we get to enjoy every moment, all the colors every day. So thank you. Thank you so much. What an inspiring list, an inspiring <laughs> message. Uh, as I was telling Jane before we got started, I prepped for several of these kinds of events and this was such a nourishing, soul-fulfilling prep. It's the most I've ever had with learning all of these wonderful things. So I have a lot of questions. Sure. So um, Chrissy, if you, if I go, oh, you, you just holler at me because I have a lot of interesting things that I want to talk about, both from the book and what you just, what you just mentioned. I wonder if we can talk about patience for a second. Would that be okay to talk about patience? Sure. Because it seems like that's sort of being patient with ourselves, being patient with others. But when I read that, it is the first chapter, I think, of the book. I think yes. it's the first chapter. Yes. What struck me so much about that was when you said, when we are impatient, we are communicating that our time is more valuable than someone else's time, that we are more valuable than someone else. And I think coming out of COVID now, there's a joy in being together, but there's also a lot of impatience. And you talk about driving several times in the, in the book as well. And so the, the people are very impatient in driving. Like, I have a 15 minute commute and I can probably count, you know, five times someone honks at someone. So how do you think we practice patience? And then the second thing we'll talk about empathy because I think that they go together, but is that something you could talk about a little bit about patience? Yeah, I, I agree. I think we came out of COVID very, very impatient. Um, it's kind of like we want to make up for time. We want to make up for all the things that we didn't do. And I, you know, and it, it, yeah, I don't, for somebody that's honking their horn and for ourselves, I think we need to just step back. I think being reactive to that isn't serving ourselves. And so that's when I was talking about, you know, when that tornado of negativity is around us, right? That's when we pull back and not wish to be a part of it. And so, yeah, there's going to be, we're going to encounter, we see a lot of impatience out there, but it doesn't belong to us. Right. And I think that's the goal belongs to them and we just want to keep it there yeah absolutely. and you talk about smiling like oh. smiling and that that's such an important and it will change your whole outlook it'll change your whole demeanor if you just smile oh absolutely what if they're honking and you go by and you smile and you're <laughs> they probably think you're crazy but maybe I had a friend who did that i don't mean to interrupt you but i literally had a friend that time we were going too slow for this person and uh -huh. they passed us and they might have said a nasty little gesture but you just wave <laughs> just Did as simple as can be and it's off-putting <laughs> i think great <laughs> so not, yeah it's not engaging in that trying exactly. to be patient exactly so, exactly yeah it is hard and i think part of that too is 
there aren't a lot of people we're, we're so conditioned i think that was a beautiful example used of amazon one of my children was like i need a ring master costume for drama tryouts he's like i need it by thursday and so he just just used to me just going on amazon and i said oh it can only get here by thursday and he was like what like use prime like we don't always but i think we're so used to that and then we're going out and there are not a lot of people working in some of the jobs. There's not, everyone is short staffed. Correct. And again, I, I know I'm talking about my children a lot, but they're working at the drive-in movie theater. They're just soda jerks and they're helping out. But people have been so awful to them. And it's given me my own patience when I go into a store or somewhere to just, I think you're right, to just breathe and just be like, these are people yeah. we, don't need, we don't need to hurry that much and I guess that brings me to this question of empathy because I think about that a lot because I think I tend to be a fairly empathic person and I'm always surprised when people aren't mm -hmm. I find that shocking sometimes right. to people so I do wonder if you think we're just naturally people just are born naturally empathic or is it kind of like a muscle that you have to work on and sort of nourish I'm curious your thoughts on that I, I like that idea that it is a muscle to nourish. I don't think we're naturally, because I think pretty much we're pretty self-centered, <laughs> you know, and truthfully. And I think we have to really practice, practice being, having some empathy for others and understanding. And that's that, that perspective and stepping back and not, not always having to be in that person's business. And I don't have to convince you of anything. You just get to be who you are, that that would be a perfect world. I know that it doesn't exist. I feel bad for your sons that people are being me. <laughs> well, people have also been lovely. People yeah. have also given them tips, so they think that's just the most exciting thing ever, ever <laughs> that they got, you know, five dollars for making a milkshake. But there is a mix. Sure, sure. Always it's a good lesson for them, but it's made me mindful of my own impatience sure, when sure. I'm at places. Yeah. And it's like it used to be because people just don't have enough people. Yeah. And we're all just, I think, so stressed and impatient. So I think yeah. everyone should be taking yoga. I am. Do you mind talking a little more about this tapping? I will be fully self-disclosive that I thought you meant tap dancing. I know. Is, I know. I love one of my ways that I like to de-stress. I used to love to go to concerts. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a huge Sting fan. So every year I would go to a Sting concert and that was like my big, just release, joyous, had a wonderful time. And of course we couldn't go to concerts. And I realized that part of going to the concert was really just listening to music and dancing and being, so I just started doing it in the house, much to the chagrin of my children. <laughs> so I want, so tap dancing might help, but I'm fascinated in that. <laughs> so, oh, take my glasses off. So tapping is just moving energy through our body and we we start chop our our hands and then we tap the top of our head between our eyebrows outside our eyebrows under our not, eyes under the nose chin top of the um your bones here your thymus and then down on your sides and um, you can go online, you'll see a lot of um, descriptions about it. And while you're tapping, that's where you practice the positive self-talk. I'm okay, I'm safe, I can do this, whatever it is that you're trying to work through. Um, I had my niece do it, who's working on her, uh, her, her exam, and she just felt a whole sense of relief through her body. And so it's, um, they're, they're using in, in schools, um, they're for just an emotional healing tool. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's so, it, it, it must be part of this whole, cause I love how you talk about paying attention to your body. I love that phrase of being selfish with your own health because we are conditioned that to have self care is to be selfish. I think we, I think right. we think that and and it used to be you know, i grew up in the late 70s and 80s and you know it was almost a badge of courage it still is with my generation i think how little sleep you can get 
Oh, I've had three three all nighters in a row because I'm just so dedicated to my job and this this notion of I think my students uh, are much more accepting of and good at self care and I think That's it's hard for us because we think it's selfish and that we that it's some but I think paying attention to your to your body is such an important point oh, and of course absolutely. intuition yeah. Yeah. So two, two pieces, it's paying attention to your body. How often are our shoulders up by our ears? You know, Chrissy was talking a little about <clears throat> her yoga and rolling her shoulders, you know, okay. I, I just came out of that meeting. My, this hurts. Okay. So what can I do to, to alleviate that? That's the goal. And then the intuition is is the listening. Um, I I'm I'm very intuitive. I'm always listening, but I have to share with Rick. He's you know he doesn't always tune in, and I know he's watching. So, <laughs> but one time we were talking about, okay, and we were about to get into um, a car to go to dinner, and he had this gut feeling that, you know, something was awry, and we ended up getting in a little bit of an accident. But, you know, you have to listen, you have to listen. You're, there's some greater force out there. If we can listen to our intuition in our bodies and our gut, it's going to lead us down the right path. So, yeah. And it's interesting. That's a, a very Western mindset of sort of pushing, tapping, tapping down the, the intuition, I think. And, uh, and this whole concept of being dedicated to, to your job and, Related to that, um, well, let me, before you go there, let me just bring out a point of tapping down our emotions. Okay, so yes. That's, that's yes. very unhealthy. It will make you but, sick. But that's what we're taught. Yes. You know, you're not allowed to feel that or you're not allowed to feel this. But Absolutely. we need to feel it. We need it. We need to, you know, whatever it is, we need to acknowledge it. And we need to let it go. So the tapping can help that. Or if you've been so wounded, massage your heart. You know, if somebody's been so cruel to you, just sit and breathe and massage your heart, you know, and just be kind to yourself. Because um, yeah, we don't we don't want to go through bruised and banged up. We wanna we wanna let it go and and the tapping. <clears throat> It, it, it is quite uh, something because emotions will come up that you haven't you. dealt with. Um, if you have a lot of stuff that you've pushed down, it's going to come up. And if you really look at, at life and things that present themselves, they're lessons that we need to learn. And unless we pay attention to it and we learn it so we can move on, it's going to present itself again. And again, and again, because you'll say, oh my God, why is this happening again? Well, because we didn't address it <laughs> the first time, you know? And so don't be ashamed of our emotions. And especially coming out of COVID, there was a whole lot of emotion surfacing. It's okay. And we need to look at it. And we, if it's too big for us, go talk to a professional. But everything we can, we can get through, we, we can. I wonder if the horn honking or the impatience is really misdirected anger at COVID. That's something oh. you can't yell at, right? It's just, yeah. It's fascinating that you talked about <laughs> you know, keeping those emotions, not letting the emotions come up because I teach a lot of gender classes, women and gender studies classes. And I, I teach a class called women, images of women, images of gender and pop culture. Sorry. And, and, a intro to women's studies class that I'm teaching now. Some of my students may be on the call, but we, masculinity in the United States is all about not having emotions, or if you do show emotions, they're anger and impatience, and those are sort of acceptable emotions, but crying, even today, I think we still have just, a, it's unhealthy. And I know, I'm sure you've read the same sorts of things where, you know, men will have heart, well, everyone will have a heart attack, but you know, there's a higher rate of hypertension among men, or there historically has been, right. and 
doctors argue it's because of keeping these emotions. So that's a really important, important point. And I do bet that the tapping sort of brings, brings all of those emotions out. Um, I want to talk a second about overextending yourselves, which is yourself, which is part of all of this. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading the book, I loved the examples of the end of the year. I love how you titled the cat. I had made the capitals the end of the year. <laughs> like he, who not, he, if you're a Harry Potter person, he who shall not be named. It was kind of like the end of the year and the holidays. And there's a there's a scholar that, that I teach a lot. His name's Kenneth Burke, uh, rhetorical scholar, philosopher. And he talks about, and he's kind of just about human nature. But he says that humans are rotten with perfection. That as a species, we are rotten with perfection. And one of the examples is the holidays. And I teach it, when I teach it, I talk about holidays. This is exactly what you're talking about. That we're so consumed with making holidays perfect or having everything that we end up miserable. Mm -hmm. that we end up completely miserable and i think that we do that perhaps daily that we that we're trying to do so much so if you want to speak to that we obviously do but also how do you say no because in your book you talk about sometimes you just have to say no so if you have any advice on sure no. well Obviously, we couldn't have our perfect, perfect holidays last year. We had to reinvent them and make them different, um, you know, which was kind of probably a good thing because um, we didn't have to have whatever it is that our tradition is, um, but have a semblance of it. But nobody, a friend of ours, their daughter just got married and she was so worried about everything being perfect. And I was like, but nobody's going to know only you and if you can let that go and so with the holidays so what if we don't get the perfect side dish or the perfect you know on the table or the decorations or no one's going to know except for us because we're the ones setting the expectation and so i think if we could just give ourselves a break and stop setting all those expectations because as the wabi-sabi says nothing's perfect you know, it's not meant to be perfect. Um, it's meant to be an unfinished piece of art. And so, so what? Let it go. <laughs> it's okay. Give ourselves permission. It's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. And the holidays, I don't know why we keep all that for the end of the year. There's so many deadlines and, you know, so what? Do it in January instead. What's the difference? <laughs> it's, it's just and then there's evidence to suggest that the that the Victorians really started a lot of the consumption and the giving gifts. So sometimes I just say blame the Victorians, which is scapegoat, <laughs> just scapegoating. <laughs> but it is. It's almost as if if you are a person who celebrates Christmas, for example, then it better be done by the 25th or you're a failure because the 26th doesn't count. Right. right and it's funny because yeah. it's just a it's just yeah. a day. Have it's, you found it easier to say no as you get older? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Not I think, that you're old. I that sounded bad, but uh, no, no. I you know, six decades you, you learn. But I think you know, I, and I think it's hard if you're younger and you have kids and you know the PTA and the sports and this and that. But I, I think that there's still opportunities to draw some lines and not overextend and not be super crazy busy making cupcakes at midnight for something for the school the next day i mean it's just um because it, uh, as you it's, sleep is important mm -hmm. and it's not about bragging that you've got little sleep it's about bragging that you got long good sleep and so i don't know just um just look at our choices and look at our day and how can we adjust and maybe we don't have to get it all done in one day maybe we spread it out over the week i don't know but i just think being more careful with our time and how we schedule things and and making sure we're not getting tired you know if you're exhausted doing something you're not having a joyful moment you're exhausted <laughs> and you know so i think being self-aware of how busy you are because we get so caught up in 
into it and you talk about making lists and and I know Sandy Tweedy, who you know well, and he's on the call, I called him yesterday about an issue. And he, when he got on the phone, he's like, I have no idea what issue this is about. I don't know if this is about A or B or C or D or E, which thing are you talking to me about? And in that moment, I thought, Gosh, I'm doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> Maybe I should. And he was lovely and he's very helpful about the issue, but it was just funny because he was like, <laughs> Which of these things that you're doing, which of these balls that you're juggling, do you need assistance with? And I thought to myself, wow, that's wow. A lot of stuff. Yeah. And I'm a perfectionist by nature. I think highly successful people tend to try to be, that sounds awful, like I'm highly successful, but I think I'm, I'm a successful yeah. person, which that's another thing too, right? We don't want to call ourselves successful when but we are we... ourselves. So, so okay. but we, and my department chair will frequently say, progress not perfection but, but we get rewarded in our culture for perfection mm, yeah i think we get yeah you're right i just think we need to kind of step back and look you know yes absolutely yeah. and breathe and you've talked a little bit about it but um the women's alliance network is this year their their focus is on reconnecting refocusing recharging and so we wanted to know what are the some of the ways that you like to reconnect, refocus, and recharge. I know you talked about tapping and doing some. Yeah, recharge. Wabi -sabi. Um, the wabi sabi, yeah. Wabi -sabi. But uh, but I you know I love being outside. I um, I was made sure I was outside every day, multiple times each day, all last year and this year. Um, I just find nature my greatest restoration. Um, I have literally had issues that I'm trying to process. And on a long walk, it's like Mother Earth just absorbed all my angst, all my stress. And by the end of the walk, I didn't even remember what I was worried about. And so I, I think being outside and being in nature is probably the biggest um, gift we all have your big connection to animals is too. I have a dear colleague and good friend who started foraging mushrooms during the <laughs> pandemic. She lives near a big woods and they have mushrooms and they forge mushrooms. It's the most fascinating thing. Our whole department is super excited about it. And <laughs> we, we got some chickens, which I had no idea how delightful chickens are. <laughs> have little personalities, but that being outdoors, being connected to nature, I think that helps us. We're intended to not be a part of nature. Right. Because, you know, we're inside, we're, you know, I think being outside, that's the best connection. Uh, you know, I have found texting to be quite boring. I find myself making phone calls more often. Um, I, I got our whole family that um, Alexa, so they have the big screen so we can see each other, you know, um, well, every once a week we have a family group. Uh, session um you have to work a little harder at it i think now since we're not seeing each other so much but um but there's ways and again filling your own cup first we've talked about that a lot and i love the analogy that you used about you know the oxygen mask you put that on your self uh, first and i think finding your voice is another interesting i think that was number four yeah. right finding your voice do you have any additional advice on how to find your voice? And that's also, I think, kind of a gender thing. We're in the Women's Alliance Network, it, both for both for men and women, though, finding yeah. your voice. Do you have other thoughts on that? Well, I, I think just practicing, I enjoy this or I don't enjoy this. You know, if you're with, Rick and I have been married 38 years now. <laughs> and, um, we learned a lot about communicating with each other being home. And so, um, you know, things that I might've just uh, blown off. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I, if I really think about it, I don't enjoy that. And so not having fear in voicing an opinion, I think is, is the first step. Uh, what's the worst that could happen? I mean, I really, you know, so not having the fear of voicing an opinion and voicing it in a kind, compassionate, constructive way, but um, 
I, I think those are the first steps. I, um, a friend of ours just had a baby and she's like eight months old and she's, she's learning to extend her voice with little screens. And I'm like, you go girl, you know, cause we were, my generation, we were not encouraged, you know? And so asking questions, ask a lot of questions, form an opinion it, it, that this was something I, I'm still learning because it wasn't a part of how I grew up. Um, and it is, and I'm so envious of today and the young women of today because they do have their voice and they do have opinions and they're not afraid to share them. And I, I think that's great. I think that's really, really great. So a oh. part of that was because of women like you though, uh, trailblazing women. I mean, I, the first female president of SGA, yeah. Yeah. obviously were not afraid of your voice at that time. And I think, and you know, seeing women in those roles, representation matters and all of that. So I think that, that, that your efforts have, have helped pave the way for that. <laughs> Thank you. So we're very appreciative of, of women like you. Thanks. Chris, I don't know, we're at 1250. Did we want to, uh, I, I can keep going all day, but I don't want to be, and it's, I'm just indulging. It's such a luxury to be able to talk to you like this, but I don't want to be um, keeping other people from asking questions. So are there other questions? Yeah, there, there was a question that came in through the Q and A. And then I know we, we also, um, had some other questions actually for Eugene that our board prepared. So, oh, okay. um, because a lot of us read the book. Um, so we were, you know, really trying to kind of think of ways to, to have some, some deeper conversations. So let me start off with the question from the Q and A. And I, I think this is really something that all of us experience. Um, and that we do delve into a lot with the Women's Alliance Network, um, you know, events and, and discussions. So essentially the question is, how do you balance it all, right? How do you, how do you take an approach to keeping track of, you know, your kids, your sleep, your house care, taking care of yourself, being, you know, moving up in the career ladder, um, for many of us taking care of old, older parents? How do you sort of, think about the approach of keeping things in the balance, right? So, and then also with that, how do you prioritize when everything feels important, right? <clears throat> okay, big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I think in trying to balance it all, we delegate as much as we can. I think, as uh, as Julie was sh sharing, um, we're, we're perfectionists and we feel like, well, if we don't do it, it's not going to get done right versus just getting it done. So I think if we can delegate a little bit more to kind of give us some more space on our plate, I think that is good. And again, looking at what needs to get done and when it needs to get done and moving things around not feeling like oh my gosh it has to get done now or today or this hour or this week but possibly just spreading things out so that it's not just all falling on us in one moment i think those are two things that that could help i mean life is throwing a lot at, at us now. And we are a sandwich generation. We have the kids and we have our elderly parents. So, so it's a lot, but delegate and see what we can spread out. But always make the time for ourselves first. I love your, your thought about delegation, right? I think that um, there's a lot of times where we take on so many um, other people's responsibilities or, or things that other people can do, right? I, like, I think what you said earlier was like, feel free to let things go, to give up a little bit of that control. Um, it, it's, a, it's difficult, it can be hard to right, let go of that control, but it's also a freeing exercise because I think, at least for me personally, um, you know, it gives me the space right that i need to take care of myself but also it gives me the chance to see oh these people who i'm trusting with this can they can they do they will 
I don't need to do this all the time. So it's really reassuring. Um, you know, something for me in the past year is in the middle of COVID, I decided I'm going back for to grad school. And I had a very frank conversation with my family. Like, I am going to need you in ways that I have not needed you before because I need to do this for me. And it was really exciting because I saw my family chipping in in ways that not that they couldn't before, but maybe that I didn't provide them the space mm -hmm. for, right? That I was kind of holding a lot of this for myself and not giving them that freedom. So I think that's that's great advice. Let, let me ask you, what do you think about the question about prioritizing, right? You said before this idea of, you know, know when things are valuable, sort of know when they're not. You know, you're, you're talking, you know, you mentioned, you know, especially around the idea of um, finance and budgeting, right? Know when you need something versus when you want something. Right. I think that does tie into, you know, setting priorities. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So what, has the shortest deadline, I guess, is let's look at that first. Um, so, because then that need versus a want might be more pressing. Um, but then, you know, if you really look at something, maybe it could be put off to the end of the week or next month. So I think it's just paying attention um, to help prioritize. Um, and, and, and also not taking on someone else's emergency and so, Julie, your son's emergency of having to have this costume—that <laughs> was his emergency. <laughs> you know, it wasn't yours. And so, and just trying to, what's ours? What belongs to others? And then prioritizing that way. And I know if you have little ones, the line is very, very fuzzy. But if they're old enough, um, yeah, a fifteen-year-old kind of needing a ringmaster costume—that is not my problem. <laughs> I will assist, but it's also a good lesson not to wait to the last minute. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so what belongs to us? What can we work with? What belongs to somebody else? How can they maybe shift things around and look at it so maybe it's not that important? You know, that's, that's wonderful. Those are my thoughts. <laughs> wonderful. So here's another question that just came through in our Q&A. Um, I love this question. So. Um, you know, you're frequently somebody who's asked for advice, right? We, we, uh, a lot of us, especially here at Rowan, um, you know, come to you for advice and, and leadership. What's the best piece of advice that was ever given to you that you could share with us? Hmm. I haven't thought about that in a long time. My, my mom taught me patience. And I think that has served me so well throughout my life. So my mom and patience, it, it, it just, it just keeps us out of trouble. <laughs> you know, we don't, yeah, that, that, I think that that would be it. Yeah. That's lovely, Jean. I think that kind of ties into the things that you were talking about before, right? Sort of this, this ability to be more mindful, to take a step back, to take a breath, to sort right. of let things have, again, I keep coming up to this idea of space, right? right. Having, right. Ha giving space to yourself, but also giving that to others. And mm -hmm. that's really, that does tie into patience so beautifully. So mm -hmm. what, a, what a wonderful lesson and gift that your mother gave you, right? Yeah. That ability to have patience. She's a cool lady. Here's a fun experiment. So, you know, we, we were, we're perfectionists and we always think like, well, you know, do you always have to be the life of the party? Do you feel like when you go into some type of gathering, you have to <clears throat> be the person? This is a good practice. Go into your next gathering, unless you're leading the meeting or something like that, and sit back and watch the space be filled by others because you because you talk about space. So when we go into something, we're filling it with ours, with us. But if we sit back, just watch. It's very entertaining because others will begin to fill the space. And then we don't have to work so hard. 
you know, we can just kind of be a small piece of the meeting or a small piece of the project. Am I making sense? Absolutely. Instead of having to be the whole piece of it. And that, that is a part of good self care and preserving ourselves. Because you can, you can go into a situation and if you have totally encased it with your energy and your intentions and you haven't allowed for anything else, you're going to come out exhausted. So that's a, that's a fun little practice. Practice that next time. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love that idea. Again, I think it's just, it's giving yourself right and other people permission. It's just mm -hmm. giving that little bit of, mm -hmm. of grace. Right. And it, and it creates the space for other people to find their voice. If your yes. voice is the only one that's always being heard, then you're not uplifting other people around you. Exactly. So, as you said. So, Jean, here's another question we had from, from actually um, one of our board members. So, just thinking about the um, financial services company that you and Rick founded, you know, based, based on that experience you talked about, right? That experience of really kind of not getting the right guidance, being misled. Um, in terms of thinking about that experience, how do, you, how do you think that experience has changed the way that you may offer advice and guidance to others? How is that living through that sort of impacted the way that you um, reach out to others and serve others? So, uh, we always put ourselves in that person's shoes for a moment. How do we wish to be treated? We wish to be treated with dignity and respect. We wish to be met where we are. So many people won't talk to a financial professional because they're so afraid and there's so much they don't know. And so that's why our goal was always to provide education so that when you do come in, you, you feel like you can ask the right questions. And so always put yourself in the other's shoes and treat them as you wish to be treated. And that's what we've always done. And um, it, we've created great success with that. And read, really there's so much information. Rick's written 10 books, go read some. <laughs> And your books as well. I, I mean, my books too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when the other side of money has such fabulous little tips and tricks in it. And, and really for me, when I, what I took the biggest piece that I took away from it was kind of this idea that you mentioned earlier of just um, being okay with being a little selfish and being okay with, you know, again, coming back to this idea of filling your own cup first. So um, I guess that, you know, one of the final questions we would have for you today is, you know, on today's event, we have a really diverse set of audience members. We have students, we have faculty members, we have staff members, we have alumna. Um, so for, I guess what, if you could think of one thing, one action item for someone to do, to take that intentional step to filling their own cup first, what would that action step be for you? I, uh, that one action step would be to take 10 minutes for yourself every morning. Um, take time for yourself. It, otherwise it just, it's a blur. The day's a blur. You don't remember what you did, who you talked to, it, what day of the week it is, what'd you have for lunch? Just, just take time for yourself. That's lovely. I love that so much. Thank you so much. Um, you. This was, first of all, this was wonderful. I just want to thank you, Julie. I want to thank you so much for partnering with us on this. This was exciting. It was lovely. Oh, it, was my, I, it was a luxury. It was truly <laughs> a luxury. It was, it was more than 10. It was an hour for myself. So yeah. thank you. How great is that? Um, so just a couple things I want to leave our audience with today. Just a few pieces of information. Um, first of all, just again, thank you to Jean Edelman and Julie Hayes for, for being with us today. We're so grateful for your time and, and truly for your support in um, here at Rowan University, but especially for the Women's Alliance Network. You know, we are just so excited that you offered your time.
and your energy to help us continue our mission. So thank you again, just from the bottom of our hearts. Um, I'd also really like to thank Denise Dennery. Um, Denise is our fabulous programming committee chairperson for the Women's Alliance Network. She and her group did a tremendous amount of work to bring, to bring this event to you today. So thank you, Denise. Um, and I also wanna thank Marie Polk and the University Advancement Team who really helped us um, with supporting us with the design and delivery of today's event and just helping us make this um, meaningful and engaging for all of you. So thank you to those teams. Um, really this work can, could not have been possible without you. Um, I do wanna let our audience know that um, there is a tremendous calendar of events coming up for the Women's Alliance Network throughout the year. You can check out our website. The calendar is posted now. Um, something just to tie in to what Jean and Julie were talking about earlier. Our next event is going to be focused on, uh, we're calling it fueling your connections, cooking through your connections. So sort of thinking about how to take care of yourself nutritionally, but when we think about the holidays. So we're going to talk about that idea of not living up, you know, not trying to be perfect, not living up to per perfection, but also we're going to be having some really dynamic speakers who come from different um, diverse backgrounds to talk about how they kind of connect their culture and their experience to cooking, to nutrition, to sort of this idea of gathering and being together. So um, be on the lookout for announcements for that. And of course, for all of our programming throughout the year, um, this is a professional development opportunity that we provide to all of you. So we hope you can come and continue to share this with your colleagues. So that's it from me. Thank you again so much for being here today. I wish you all continued health and wellness. Denise is showing us, reminding us here, the, the copy of Jean's book, The Other Side of Money. Um, it's available now, so you can find it on Amazon. You can also find it at the Roman Bookstore. Um, so we'd encourage you to go ahead and take a, take a look into that. It's a really lovely um, lesson for us all. So thank you again, Jean and Julie, thank so you. much for it was being such with a us joy. today. Thank you so much. I had such a great time. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Be well, everybody. Bye. Have a great day.